start. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Virginia Cooperative Extension Virtual Plant Clinic. And what a wonderful thing to do on such an absolutely rainy Saturday morning. Um, this morning, I want to remind folks, if you would, to please mute yourself, keep yourself muted throughout the presentation uh, so that we don't have any extemporaneous noise uh, interrupting our presenter. And if you have to get walk around or move, you know, cut your video. Um, today's agenda, uh, Anne, if you'll advance, next slide, please. Uh, today's agenda, we're gonna have a short presentation on white grubs, and then we're going to review those questions submitted uh, during, the res uh, during their registration process, and we have a few today, and then we're gonna answer questions just from the chat and from the attendees. So, uh, again, keep, please keep yourself muted. And uh, use, if you have questions that come up during the presentation, please use the chat box to enter those questions. And we'll take those questions at the end of the presentation. So now I want to introduce our presenter today, Fairfax County Master Gardener, Ann Mason, who is going to talk to us about what is bugging my lawn. Ann, I'll turn this over to you. Thanks, Susan. I'm Ann Mason, and I'm a Master Gardener with the Fairfax County Master Gardeners. Well, you might have known it's hot, it's August, and it's raining, and many lawns are starting to have brown patches. And today's presentation, we're going to explore one of the many reasons for this, grubs. In our hot Virginia summers, cool season turf grasses, and those with tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass get stressed from heat, from being cut low, that is lower than the three and a half to four inches recommended. Now cutting cool season turf grass low is like a military haircut. There's little grass to work as a sun barrier and as the soil heats up it's like giving the, so the roots a sunburn. The third reason is insufficient water. Turf grasses need one inch of water per week and that's best applied once a week so the soil gets saturated deeply. And the fourth is dull lawnmower blades. Dull blades tear the grass rather than cut the blade. These tears allow bacteria, virus, and fungal pathogens to enter the leaf stem. But we're, we're talking about grubs today. Um, our, our colleague, Tony Makara, addressed lawn diseases in his October, I'm sorry, August 22nd presentation which is available on the VCE Fairfax County YouTube channel. So in this graphic, we can see that there are lots of critters above and below ground and that find turf grass really appetizing. But today we're going to focus on four common beetles in the Scarabiidae family. Of these four scarab beetles, the most likely cause of turf damage is Japanese beetle, but all larval forms of these scarab beetles are called grubs and they all look similar. So a couple telltale signs that you might have grubs is the first is in the upper left photo. You can see in this photo that something has been digging into the turf grass could be a raccoon or a fox or some other varmint, but they're looking for that tasty grub feast. In the top right photo, you see one of the second indicators that you might have grubs. You can pull your lawn, you can pull your turf right up and roll it like a carpet because it has few or no roots. And third, in the small center um, picture, you see that there are when you dig a hole, you see these characteristic C shape of the white grub. So if you see grubs, do you run for the insecticide? Well, not yet. The first step is to really verify that you have white grubs from all the possible sources and that you know what that white grub is. So you wanna count the white grubs. So Virginia Tech recommends a couple of different sampling mechanisms. The first is their standard digging a hole, a 12 inch square hole by six inches deep. Then you examine the soil either by putting it through a screen with a large mesh or hand sifting. 
The purpose is to count the number of grubs in that area. The second method is a slightly smaller hole, eight inches square by six inches deep. But for the homeowner, Virginia Tech recommends that you do one of these two size squares about two or three inches deep might be sufficient. So once you've counted your grubs, if you have six or more in your sampling, then control may be warranted. Less than six, it's up to you. The turf experts recommend that some turf grasses with less than five grubs should be able to withstand the assault on their roots. Okay, so let's imagine now that you have white grubs, you've counted them, and that you, term, you determine that you either want or need to do something. So what you do for control depends upon the grub. And all grubs look pretty similar. You can see they have a, a C shape when they're not moving through the soil. They're whitish in color. They have brownish heads. They have three pairs of legs near the head. And while they have different sizes when they're mature, in August and September, when they're actively feeding and growing, how do you tell them apart? Well, we look at the raster. And this is the opposite end of the mouth. Some people might call it the butt. You'll need a 10x magnifier to see the larva bristles. And they sport different configurations of these bristles or hairs on the raster. And by the way, this is a great activity for your kids. It practices the observation skills and they learn a little bit about nature. So let's take a look at our four common beetles. The first is our Japanese beetle, which is most likely the grub in your turf grass. If you saw these metallic brown and green beetles flying around in June and July, happily munching holes in your roses or perennials in the rose family, then chances are that the larva below in, that, in the soil nearby are probably Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles like to feed on broadleaf plants like Rose of Sharon, hollyhocks, apples, cherries, pears, peaches, grapes, Japanese maple, Norway maple, horse chestnut, black walnut, ash, and many more of nearly 400 broadleaf plants. So if your brown patch is close to your favorite plant that, that, happen, that Japanese beetles like to munch on, the grub could be a Japanese beetle. Because beetles emerge, munch on foliage, happily mate, lay eggs in the soil close by the plant and then die. As an aside, my favorite way to get rid of these Japanese beetles on my rose bushes is to hold a bucket of soapy water under the branch and knock the, the beetles off into the water. I'm wary about spraying any kind of insecticide on the beetles because our beneficial pollinators are active at the same time. So let's look at the raster of the Japanese beetle. You see that there is a V-shape um, sort of bristle pattern on the, the raster in that middle photo. Okay, let's move on to the masked chafer beetle. You might have seen this small yellow-brown beetle skimming over your turf at dusk. Or perhaps you saw a beetle flying around your lights on your porch, street, or lawn path. Look at the raster. You can see a completely different pattern. The hair bristles appear random. Now on to the larger green June bug. You might see this beetle skimming over your turf grass during the day, but take a look at the raster. The hair pattern has two irregular rows of bristles. And the last beetle that we're going to look at of the many beetles in this family is the tiny, shiny, reddish-brown Asiatic garden beetle. This beetle spends daylight hours under the soil feeding on roots, but at night it emerges and flies around attracted to lights. Now look at the raster. We see com another completely different pattern. The hair bristles look like Y shapes around the anal slit. There are other bristles, other beetles I didn't cover and all have different patterns. So in my last slide, I have a great reference. If, one, if, you see a, if you have a larva that doesn't have one of these patterns, 
there's a resource for you. Now that you've narrowed down your grub to a beetle, how do we control it? And when do we control it? All four of these scarab beetles have one generation per year. In June and July, the adult beetles emerge from the soil, flies around to find a suitable food supply, mates, and the female lays eggs in the soil. These eggs hatch in one to two weeks, depending upon the beetle. The larval form excuse me, of the grub starts actively feeding on the plant roots. Today we're talking about turf grasses, but some of these larva beetles, like the Asiatic garden beetle, also feed on your roots of your ornamental plants. In August and September, grubs actively feed near the surface, usually in the top two or three inches. As the soil cools, the grubs move deeper and spend the winter deep underground, growing larger. In the spring, the grub larva will move closer to the surface as the soil temperature rises and they'll start beating again. But these large plump grubs will be harder to kill. It will pupate and then emerge as an adult June in, in late June and late July. So the whole cycle starts all over again. So the time to control grubs is when they're small. That's now, late July, August, and September. If you think you have a grub issue, now is the time to act. So in summary, grub issues are localized in your lawn and they can, in some lawns, can tolerate a few grubs. You really think about controlling grubs if they're over six grubs per square foot. Control them in July through early September when the grubs are small and close to the surface. Spring is not the time to control them because they're too large for the chemicals to act or biological agents. So you have a couple of control mechanisms. First, you have milky spore, which is a bacteria, Panabacillus populi, and you can, you can apply it to the local area where there are active grubs. Now, milky spore acts slowly and it may take 30 days for the grubs to kill. However, once the bacteria is established in your soil, the control can be effective for years without further application. And because the bacteria populate, perpetuate, and spread by infecting and being transported by the grubs. But note that milky spore is only for Japanese beetles. And a word of caution here, if you apply another insecticide to the area treated with milky spore, you'll slow the spread of the bacteria. So that's not really desired. Your second option is Bacillus thuringiensis. And there are different, or Bt for short, there are different strains of Bt. And Bt contains crystal proteins that are toxic to Japanese beetles. Now there are two, there are products with two strains that are toxic a bit with both adults and larva. And there's other products that only have the protein that's only toxic to larva. So you need to read the label and choose your right, the right protein. The third bac bacterial uh, control is that Gardner can choose an endo en entomopathogenic nematode. Now there are a couple of different kinds of nematodes. The one with herabidides as an active ingredient is the one to use for these larvae. Nematodes should be applied only when the pest is present and they applied late in the day to avoid exposure to and damage from the UV light. And as the soil temperature should be at least 60 degrees Fahrenheit and early spring treatments are not effective because the soil temperatures are too low. So in addition to these biological controls, insecticides are, are possible. And there's two active ingredients. Chlorodianthus, I'm sorry, chlorodianidin or imidacloprid are the two active ingredients that you want to look for. 
there's lots of there's lots of you um, specific products that have these two and once you apply them to the your local area where the grubs are you want to water the area so that they will move in as for all agents chemical or biological you need to read the label and apply as directed so now to those resources that i mentioned this first resource on this list the economic pests of turf grass is a terrific resource it's available as a small booklet it's also available online as a, a digital booklet and has great pictures. It's very good general for looking at all of your different grubs and beetles and worms that might be attacking your grass. 